I'm Peter Clausen from Bugs in Cyberspace, and in today's video, we're going to be looking at velvet worms. Hey, you guys. Well, if you can see me over this tank here, I'm putting together a video about velvet worms and I was going to include it as part of this video but I can see now that I took so many clips of the velvet worms already that I want to do a separate video that is just specific as to the setup of a velvet worm tank. I had started putting this one together including this LED light strip up here for some of the plants I'm going to be putting in the tank as I set it up. And I'm going to be following this amazing care sheet by Mackenzie Harrison, who I sourced the velvet worms from. He's in British Columbia, Canada, and he is pretty much, there goes an email. There, he's pretty much the authority on setting tanks up for them and reproducing this particular species, Epiperipatus barbadensis from Barbados in captivity. And so in this video, we're just going to sort of take a preview at some of my mainly feeding attempts, failed feeding attempts with the velvet worms. It's really hard to capture their feeding on camera. I repeatedly tried with some isopods to capture it and failed, but you can see that process as I went through it as well as some really good close-ups of the velvet worms themselves. And we'll be doing a tank setup in the next video I'll upload probably next week, where I build this bioactive tank with the clay pellets on the bottom and then a screen mat to allow for proper drainage with the right substrate up on top and some other decor in the tank to make it work. And uh, I put this light setup together here today. It comes with a timer. Uh, they like it mainly dark. They like it very humid. But I'm going to be putting some plants in the tank, including this peacock spike moss over here, which is one of my all-time favorite plants. And uh, it looks really cool under this light, I have to say. So. Please enjoy this video. I'm going to be putting a little playlist together um, where I group all of the videos that I make on velvet worms over time. And this video will be in it as well as the setup video for their tank probably next week. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or suggestions in the comments down below, please feel free. I'm learning a lot about this myself. I don't normally set up display tanks, but this is an animal that really deserves and really needs a specific kind of tank setup. And as Mackenzie says in the care sheet, the dart frog community is probably best suited and uh, to be used as a model for an appropriate kind of tank for velvet worms. High humidity, uh, a little warmer than room temperature is recommended, and then some of the bioactive elements in terms of plants and proper drainage and microorganisms and the right microbial balance in the tank to provide the healthy kind of environment that they need. So we'll be exploring all of those uh, parameters, details in the next video. Thanks again. So here they are in their temporary tank. Before I move them into the new tank, a little bit of mold is growing here on the surface. It was under some of that sphagnum moss, as were the velvet worms. You can see that specimen there has some of the sometimes characteristic, I don't know, freckling, I guess you could call it. And then there's an interesting feature on this bottom specimen here. Can't quite figure out what that is, but there's a little bit of a break, it looks like. 
on the side of the body. We'll maybe come back to that and take a closer look in a minute. You can see this one winding its way underneath that bit of sphagnum moss. Hadn't looked at them in a few days and a little bit of mold started to grow over the surface of the substrate here, just where it's moist, less so over there in the drier regions of the tank. The specimen here is somewhere in the one to three inch range. And then just under this bit of sphagnum moss here, a real clump of them. Are they communal? Yes, very much so. And in the absence of shelter elsewhere in this temporary tank, they seem to be sheltering among and even underneath each other. They definitely stretch out as they're walking, become significantly longer. So a velvet worm and a powder blue isopod. Put that isopod just near the velvet worm and its antenna is nearly touching it See if we can generate some kind of response. Doesn't look like much so far. Moving the isopod. Well, very near to it and it's retreating. I think there might be a little bit of slime from one of the other velvet worms here and so I'm kind of fishing with the isopod here at this point. just want to see some evidence of them feeding. not a taker. So we'll try this one down here. doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> Although I lost my line there. We'll come back here to our powder blue colony and drop another one over here in the corner. Two of them actually. See what happens. See if that generates a different kind of feeding response with the isopod moving more naturally or normally. Well, no response.
So they both recoiled from it. And I have a good feeling that that isopod is probably now covered in the sticky substance. You can sort of see the underside of one here that is kind of meandering its way in and out among this clump of others. Kind of a rare sight to see the animal from that angle. So here's part of an isopod that I just found. It looks like it's tank mates. Half ate it. Not sure if it's dried out or not, but let's put that in there. See if there's any kind of response at all to a partially decayed bit of isopod. Just to see if they do any scavenging as opposed to showing some interest in live prey earlier. That looks like a no for that one. Let's try over here with this one. And again, negative. Let's try a slightly larger isopod here. Hmm. So I just flipped this cork bark piece over. There was an isopod near it and I wanted to check to see if the isopod it was already dead when I left it in there. I wanted to see overnight if they would scavenge it, and it appears that, well, I can't say for sure. It's possible that they fed on it to some degree, but it looks mostly intact to me. You can see the uropods there at the terminal end, and then this is the head up here at this end. It's kind of shiny, kind of suspicious looking, but, uh, I just don't know. Now, as I was turning this piece of cork bark over, I did unfortunately disturb this little clump. They weren't under the cork bark as I had thought they would be. They were just nearby under this mass of sphagnum moss all clumped up together. But you can see that one of the individuals, maybe two of them, I'm not sure, they shot out this bit of slime and you can see if you look closely down there in the middle some of the droplets kind of the same way that spider webs look if you look very carefully at them or under magnification droplets along the strands and i think i read that they will actually re-ingest the slime once they have used it it's a very expensive liquid to make, as I've read, that you don't want to disturb them unless you absolutely have to. And the reason for that is that it requires a lot of energy for them to remake this liquid. It would be really neat to see it go down there and reabsorb that liquid. I'm not even sure that this individual here was the one that shot it out though. When I, I'm wearing a headlamp and sometimes I think that they're not behaving normally because they're trying to escape the light 
and so just really secretive animals and see a few more hiding down in there I just don't feel like I'm getting to know them that well because they aren't like so many of the other so-called bugs that I work with where the predators, for example, will pretty much have an immediate feeding response when prey is offered to them. And even the scavengers like isopods and millipedes, they'll generally take to foods that are offered to them rather quickly. Oh, was neat to get those close-ups and to see those little foot tips. They seem to be extendable. Watching that one that's on the bit of sphagnum moss there, darker against the pale background, that particular toe or tarsi not exactly sure what they call them here on the velvet worms, but it looked quite long and extended. <laughs> 